Welcome to the Cybersecurity Competition Federation Show. I'm Dan Manson. I teach computer information systems at Cal Poly Pomona and serve as principal investigator for a National Science Foundation grant to help form an umbrella organization over cybersecurity competitions. The Cybersecurity Competition Federation can support the development of skill at a large scale by bringing cybersecurity competitions under an umbrella organization, which will help players of all ages and skill levels identify a point of entry into a continuum of cybersecurity competition experiences. With a focus on communication and promotion, the CCF maintains the autonomy of competition creators, supports their business models, and does not interfere with their sponsorship or funding sources. This week, we have on-site coverage from the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition in San Antonio, Texas. 10 teams from across the nation competed for the 2015 Alamo Cup. Let's take a look at NCC DC. What do you like about this competition? Well, I like the nature of the competition, you know, just, I guess, the thrill of competing, but I also like getting the real experience of defending and the hacks, because you just can't learn that in class. So this is our 10th anniversary. Um, it's our largest season that we've had up to date, and so what we've done this year is had a little bit more to the network. We actually have three different environments the teams are working with. Uh, we've partnered up with the Pacific Northwest National Labs, and this year we've done an electrical utility. So the students are protecting a commercial network infrastructure as well as a control network and a plant network that deal with electrical generation and power management. Yes, we're trying to make sure that there are enough visualizations such that somebody who comes in can understand what it is that's going on in the competition. So at any given moment you can take a look at the different screens that we have, the different displays that we have, and understand what's going on, who's doing well, who's having problems, so on and so forth. Are we moving in the direction where this is something that can go out across the internet during the competition and back home, you know, we can have rooms full of students that are rooting on their team and they can see changes going on in the momentum and stand up and cheer and so we'll have film crews out of, out of a different location showing the audience, the audience reacting. Are, are we getting to the point where we can actually show scoring at that level where people can respond? I think we're going to have the tools to that will allow uh, for that to happen. The one thing that I think you're going to still need potentially is we may need uh, a color commentator, if you will, because some of the displays will make sense to individuals who um, know something about uh, security or, or, or computers, but for uh, the lay person, if you will, they may still need a color commentator, but we're, going to, we're getting there. We're getting to the point where you can, can see, get a feel for, no matter what your background is, how the competition is running. It's showing us uh, every team in the competition. Mm -hmm. So each one of these cities represents one of the blue teams. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of these buildings represents a machine that is owned by that particular team. And then within each machine, at this scale it's hard to tell, but there are actually ports for each machine and those are, those represent the open ports for that machine. These represent what is really occurring in the competition? Yeah, it's near real time. So I mean, if you looked at the logs and you looked at the data, this is what's going on. So you'll see uh, the operations scoring engine that'll fire off and you'll see a sweep going around. Um, you'll see that the red team will try and, you know, um, test. So, so can you see if a port is open or closed? Yes. How? Uh, we have uh, canary boxes behind each blue team network. And so that runs Nmap uh, periodically, and that determines whether or not uh, uh, service is up or down. The winner of the 10th Annual National Police Cyber Defense Competition for the second year in a row, the University of Central Florida. Congratulations, but uh, for teams coming in, what would you say is the, the recipe for success? What should they focus on if they want to win at a regional and then come on to a uh, national? Probably uh, think like the think like the attacker. Um, understand what their mentality is and be able to counter that. And like team cohesion and just like being able to work well with each other. Like our team, we're pretty much just all friends. And, like hang out outside of this competition. So being able to get along with everyone and like understand. Even when, like, you're not given the most information, but you know what you're, they're talking about, it yeah. surely helps. We are continuing our segment this week called Inside the Game. With me is Dr. Jason Pittman. 
Jason, welcome back. Thanks, Dan. Hey, everybody. Jason, I was impressed with the quality of play in NCCDC this year, as well as the progress made in enabling spectators to view how teams were performing. My top three teams were correct, although not in the order I picked. Before we start, I want to show you a picture posted on Twitter by ITT Tech Boise. Pound Uncle Jimmy was a hit, and although your tip did not pay off this time, we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Jason, Uncle Jimmy, next year? Uh, you know, the hashtag Uncle Jimmy has legs, I'm not sure if Uncle Jimmy does have legs anymore at this point. Well, I'm going to ask you about a competition coming up, see if Uncle Jimmy has any input to that one. Sure. But let's talk about the clip that we just saw. What do you think? You know, I agree. I, I think we saw the teams really upping their game. More importantly, you, I know you have some great insights into the spectator, the, the voyeurism of the sport, and how some of the things we saw might enable some future innovation. Well, I, I think I saw a turning point, because this year there was a real attempt to have spectators view how the competition was going. What I think we really need now is to take the the play-by-play -play that Dr. White was talking about and see what we can do with it. What I'd like to see next year is one of the regionals or nationals wants to do it, to have these two commentators receive a list of 50 exploits and 50 injects. And these are the exploits and the injects that could be used in the competition. So they know in advance what the potential exploits and injects are, they read up on them, and they have knowledge of this going into the competition. Then when there is an exploit that's being tried out or an inject that's being delivered, they know at that point what it is and what they can say about it, and they're communicating this to the audience. So they're communicating to the audience live what the exploit is, how it works, and how the teams are being scored by it. When an inject is occurring, they're explaining to the audience the importance of the inject, why it matters in the context of the competition, but also in the context of the real world. I, I really think that we're close to, to having this play to an audience. Yeah, and I think it's the last piece to really complete the true sports analogy. When you sit back and you watch football, basketball, baseball, whatever, you, you have the color commentators. Esports, the same thing. However, in those situations, those commentators have the benefit of expertise, like our commentators do, but also the benefit of seeing the plays develop in real time. The nature of cyber competitions inherently is different because the technology makes that opaque. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important, and it's interestingly that it's trivial, to rig up either a simple audio cue or a visual cue between the red team and the color commentators to say, red, if it's red, the light, then it's the red exploit. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I'm right. running the red exploit. Or we can have these visual cues. And I know up to now there's been some concern about too much knowledge for the teams while they're playing. They don't, we don't want them to know what the injects are. We don't want them to know what the exploits are before the competition. But I, I think we're getting past the point of having it be hidden from the audience, and I, I don't think it's going to affect the team play. No, and, and in fact, I, I tend to have two problems with that scenario, um, keeping things secret. First of all, it's unrepresentative of reality. In the real world, in industry, you, ha you know what vulnerabilities are out there, unless we're talking about zero days, but zero days are zero days because they're zero days, right? But otherwise, you know what's possible. The other thing is it's very bad game design. Keeping it secret is the equivalent of me going out on a quest in World of Warcraft but the game not giving me the quest text. Well, where the hell am I going? I would have no idea. Well, since I'm involved with the Western Regional, I'm volunteering us to try this as a pilot next year. But let's get back to Uncle Jimmy. So we have DevCon coming up in the summer. Um, at what point is Uncle Jimmy going to have a pick? Well, I think the doctor told him three to six weeks till he can talk. Um, that kind of gets us out to the pre-qualifier, and I think we'll have some better ideas then. Sounds good. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Dan. See you, everybody. We will be back next week with a discussion with Dr. Greg White of UTSA SAIS on the Collegiate Cybersecurity Championship Cup. If you have a competition you would like us to cover in a future show, please contact us at cyberfed.org. I'm Dan Manson. See you next week.